This is Anchored in Christ, the sermon podcast that gives you hope in the gospel as an anchor for your soul. Brought to you from Old South Presbyterian Church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. For over 20 years and pray for these things? How does it feel? said the old man. It feels like I'm praying to a wall. Well, how many of us can identify with that man? In our prayers, it's like praying to a wall or up to the ceiling or to the door that's been shut from the inside. In Ruth, we are going to find this silence of God. And then we're going to look at how God is heard in the silence. And then we're going to hear the blessing of God. First, the silence. From the opening verse, it's like going down rapidly into a deep pit of despair. It would be like turning on, and the first scene is of a family driving in a car, and they're happily going along the highway, and a Mack truck comes into their lane and hits them head on. That's what happens in this first verse. We read, in the days when the judges ruled. Now that's shorthand for the entire book of Judges, just before Ruth. What happened in Judges is that the people of Israel did what was right in their own eyes, and it became a national, a social, moral chaos. It was chaotic. Everything, spiritual, political, had no reference to God. And the judgment of God was on the land. On top of that, there's a famine in the land. There's not enough food to stay alive. Right now, right now, in 2019, there are one billion people around the earth who don't get enough food to live a healthy life. 36 million people will die this year of hunger. And if we do the math, which I know we've got great mathematicians here, that's more than one person a second dying of hunger right now. So we have a man and his wife who named their two sons Malon and Chilion. Malon means sick. Chilion means wasting away. They named their children like you would tree rings according to what's going on in the weather pattern. Jesus said that fathers know how to give good gifts to their children. For the, children. For the sake of his family, Elimelech and his wife leave the promised land. And they become refugees, seeking refuge and food in the neighboring country of Moab. Now, the father's name is Elimelech. That means, my God is king. His wife, Naomi, means the pleasant one. They're from Bethlehem. That means house of bread. But do you realize that the house of bread is empty? It's closed until further notice. Then things get worse. Elimelech dies, and Naomi is left with her sons. They marry Moabite women. These are women of another, of another culture and a completely different religion that practices child sacrifice. Child sacrifice. For 10 years they live in Moab, and both of the son's wives remain barren. Unthinkable. 10 years, both of them, neither have children. And what does God say? We hear the silence of God. Early in our marriage, Jim and I lived in San Antonio, Texas. And there was a couple. She was in her late 70s. He was in his early 80s. Will and Rachel Morris. Will and Rachel were the delight of the young adults in our church. 
They opened their home every Wednesday night for the young adults to meet, to have a, a shared dinner and to sing and to do Bible study and to pray. Rachel and Will loved Rachel and Will loved us. They loved particularly our toddler, James. Offered to babysit, offered to take him any time they could so that we would have time away. Rachel and Will, when they were younger, had four children, three boys and one girl. And when their two older boys were seven and five, they came down with measles. And the measles turned into pneumonia. They called the doctor. They stayed at the bedside. They prayed all night long. The seven-year-old died. The five-year-old lingered. And then the five-year-old died. Their youngest son grew up to be a fine man. He went to the Air Force Academy. He flew planes in the Korean War and died when he was when he was shot down. Will and Rachel, like Naomi, experienced the silence of God. Naomi could not generate any income. Women could not work. Now she had two dependent daughters-in-law. There were no Sunday sandwiches, no clothes closets, no food banks. There was no welfare state. She changes her name from Pleasant One which is Naomi, to Mara, bitter one. Now, in the four tiny chapters of Ruth, this is all of Ruth right here in the Bible, out of the whole Bible, we do not hear God's voice. God does not come in a person like he does with Adam and Eve in the garden. He doesn't come in a dream like he does with Abraham. He doesn't come like a, a stranger who's a messenger, like, like an angel, as with Abraham and Jacob and Joseph. In the book of Ruth, God remains invisible and inaudible, even in a series of family tragedies. But perhaps Naomi's experience is a lot like your own, what you actually experience in a life of faith. Some wonder whether they even have faith at all because there are no supernatural visitations. There are no chill bumps. There's no tingling of the spine in prayer or in Bible reading. And even in the personal crises or in national crises. It's as if God is nowhere to be found. Can you relate to Naomi? God was silent for Naomi, Naomi, for Will and Rachel Morris, and maybe even for you. But in the book of Ruth, what we find is that the silence of God does not keep God from speaking. Now, how is it that God is heard in silence? In the midst of silence, God is throughout Ruth. It's a little bit like going to Oxford, England. And if you're looking for the Oxford University and you're a tourist, you might be quite perplexed. You look around and you go, well, where is it? Well, it's both nowhere and everywhere because Oxford colleges are spread across the entire city. There is no one location for the university. It's the same with God speaking in Ruth. God is heard, how? Through scripture that is known and lived. Let's look at that. God is heard through scripture, known and lived. When Naomi returns to Bethlehem from Moab, she appeals to her daughters-in-law, and she says, go back, go, go back to your families and to your religion. Ruth says, no way. I'm going to cling to you. In spite of all your losses, there is no way I'm going to give up on you. Or she uses the personal word for God, Yahweh. That's why in your scripture when you see L-O-R-D, capitalized, that's the, that's the proper name for God, Yahweh. 
proper name for God, Yahweh. I'm not going to leave you. Naomi has so lived the word of God that it has transformed her. Though her life is bitter, she is not bitter towards her daughter-in-laws. She is not, she is not a person who has been shaped by her experience. She's been shaped by the word of God, and it comes forth in her relationship of graciousness, kindness, and faithfulness, all reflection of God. This is what set Will and Rachel Morris apart. Their life story was bitter. Their love for God and others was sweet. Is that said of you? Do you want to be shaped by God's word in such a way that you bear God's image to others? God, God speaks through scripture that's known and lived. Naomi actually knew the commandments of God that were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. She knew them. They were part of her oral tradition, and she lived them. So when they get back into Bethlehem, she instructs her daughter-in-law, Ruth, to go and glean in the field. This is something that God designed. Now, for those who are unfamiliar with gleaning, it is something that we hear in Deuteronomy 24. And it was practiced by a righteous man, Boaz, who knew God's command through Moses and did it. Hear from Deuteronomy 24. When you harvest in your field and overlook a sheaf, do not go back and get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord God may bless you them for the others. When you harvest grapes from your vineyards, do not go over the vines a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. In other words, be generous because God has been generous with you. God is thinking about the fatherless, the foreigner, the widow. You do it. Word of God known and lived. Boaz knew and lived God's word. That's how it's known in Ruth. What else? In chapter 3, we've got, we've got Naomi telling Ruth, all right, there's a practice that Moses gave us through the commandment of God, the Leverite practice. If a husband dies, his wife is a widow, there is no child in the family, the next of kin is to act the part of the hen, is to act the part of the husband, so that the deceased has an heir. It's called the leveret practice. She tells Ruth this, and if you want some risque reading, read chapter 3. And so we've got Boaz knowing the same word, living the same word, and he says, yes, I will be the husband of this Moabite woman. Because that's what God would have me do. And he marries Ruth. Now, did they have any idea that their son, Obed, would become the father of Jesse, who was the father of King David? Did they have any idea that their knowing Scripture, their obeying Scripture, would lead to the King David, who would then, in Matthew's genealogy, lead to Jesus, the Messiah. Scripture has consequences that bless the world. How well do you know Scripture? Years ago, the Presbyterian Church did a survey, and it found that only 50% of all churchgoers could name four Gospels. I bet you could, right? All right, come on, come on, come on. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You're the 50%. Yes. Okay, a Pew survey found that 45% of all Americans believe that the golden rule is one of the Ten Commandments. It's not. When the Episcopal priest Barbara Brown Taylor lived in Atlanta, Georgia, after service she went outside just as she saw a parishioner who had been going to church forever, 
go out with her who had been going to church forever, go outside with her. And she witnessed and heard an encounter she will never forget. The parishioner went out and accidentally bumped into a man who was standing there by the street, looking up towards the sky, probably looking at the steeple with the cross. She bumped into him and apologized quickly and was preparing to move on when the man said, tell me, what is it you believe in there? The woman wanted to reply, uh, but she couldn't put anything into words. She stumbled around trying to say something, and, and the man said, never mind, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I bothered you. And then he walked away, perhaps for good. Away, perhaps for good. If you were asked today, tell me, what do you believe? What, 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 do you, what do you believe? What would you say? Do you know what is written? And do you live it? What does your life speak? And finally, in the silence of God, God is heard through the spoken blessing. In these four tiny chapters, 23 times, blessings in the name of the Lord are given. Naomi blesses her daughters-in-law. Boaz blesses the workers in his field. He blesses Ruth. The elders in the town bless Boaz and Ruth who are going to get married, bless the fruit of uh, the, the marriage and what it will mean for Israel. The townswomen, when they, see, when they see baby Obed, they pick him up and they bless the Lord and then they bless his life and they bless Naomi. Now, what is a blessing? Now, excuse me, but for those who come from the South, you know, bless your heart. Bless your heart is not a blessing. Bless your heart is a veiled way of saying, you poor idiot. But in Scripture, the blessing of God begins in Genesis 1. He saw what he had made and it was good. He saw the man and the woman and it was very good. It's a blessing. The blessing in Scripture is a public spoke, spoken declaration of being in the favor of God. Blessing communicates a power. It's like a power is coming forth for prospering, for success. The opposite of blessing is curse. It enters in Genesis 3 with sin. But God counters the curse. In, in Genesis 12, he calls Abram and his offspring, he says, through you, all families on earth will be blessed. Blessed to be a blessing. Now, those who are in Jesus Christ know what I'm about to say. When Jesus was baptized in obedience to Scripture, he came up out of the water and he heard the Father say, you are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Well pleased. This is before he had done anything in ministry. He received the blessing of his father. When you are in Christ, you believe in him, you're baptized in his name, the father gets to be experienced in the same way that Jesus experienced the father. The love of God has been pursuing you your whole life long. And finally, you feel it. You see it. His face shines upon you. The blessing of Christ fills us with every spiritual blessing. So what should we do with this? We should speak it. Not just think it. When this whole world experiences the silence of God, you can be the voice of God in giving a blessing. 
If you are blessed, then bless others. How? There are three ways. I, I, I learned this from Tim Keller teaching. One is to notice when someone has got gifts. They've got, they've got a talent that God's given. They've got a capacity that God has given, a mind. They've got skills. And you bless them. A blessing is your spirit with Christ giving them a word of encouragement and calling forth who they are. Bless you for your hard work. Bless you for your mind. Bless you for your artistic ability. Bless you for the creativity that you have. Bless you in your business. It can be also a word that notices someone's sacrifice. Bless you for those hours that you give in the kitchen. Give in the kitchen. Bless you for raising children. Bless you. God bless you for the dedication in building or serving that you're doing. And it also can be in the fruit that you see in someone's life. Bless you for utilizing what you have and, and having continued to give it. I see fruit in what you're doing your music that you play. There are some who have never received a blessing. They never got it from a father, maybe from a mother. Maybe they've never heard it from a spouse, they've never heard it from a coworker. Or if they have heard it from any of them, it's been so long (laughs) that they, they forgot. It doesn't have to be that way anymore. The Lord bless you. God bless you. God blesses you in Christ. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If God carried a wallet, your photo would be in it. God is crazy about you. You are blessed in Christ to be a blessing. Now who are you going to bless? Let's pray. Lord, the world is really not hearing a lot of your voice. But it goes forth through creation. It goes forth in the word. And the word changes us so that we can bless you and bless others in your name. We pray that we may receive it so that we may give it. And Jesus. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Old South Presbyterian Church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. If you'd like more information about our historic church, or you'd like to find out more about the gospel of Jesus, please visit our website at oldsouthnbpt.org. The peace of Christ be with you.